Committee of the Whole Meeting, Monday, May 21st, 2018, 7.02 p.m. Clerk, please call the roll. Here. 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 Kiesling. Here. Peters. Here. Waring. Absent and Revolt. Here. Six present, Mr. President. Thank you. Motion to excuse the member Waring. Second. Serretta. Yes. Fold. Yes. Feinstein. Yes. Kiesling. Yes. Peters. Yes. And Revolt. Yes. Six yes to excuse Council Wong and Waring. All right. Thank you very much. First up, we have a uh, discussion from uh, Mr. Ray Hexamer the president of the Stark Economic Development Board. Mr. Hexmer, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks for your time. I uh, appreciate I uh, wanted to give you a quick update on some of the things we're doing at the Stark Economic Development Board. And uh, wanted to uh, let you know I've been in this position a little over a year. We, I followed Steve Paquette, uh, who unfortunately passed recently, but did a, a great job over 23 years. And I am not an economic developer. I came from the, the business world. Uh, and Steve felt that it was uh, maybe a good time to have someone with a business background lead the Economic Development Board. So it's been a great pleasure to do that and have been fortunate enough to work with some folks here at North Canton as we've done some different things together. So let me tell you a little bit uh, about uh, the Stark Economic Development Board. And if we can hit the next slide. <coughs> Uh, it's a private, nonprofit uh, business organization. It was formed back in 1985. Our funding, we run on a very lean budget, it comes from uh, foundations locally and uh, also comes from corporate and, and some government of, of entities. So we thank North Canton for always supporting the Stark Economic Development Board. Uh, our mission is to help existing businesses grow and expand and attract new companies to our community and, and help entrepreneurs start businesses here. When I took this job, I looked at it as a business and I looked at the county uh, as a business and fortunately Mark Samolsic from the Stark Community Foundation, and you may have heard of a thing called Strengthening Stark, uh, we took a look at our community and sort of level set it uh, on where we are because the foundations are getting hit more and more for requests for funding. And if you looked at this as a, a business, there's some alarming statistics about our county. Uh, in your packets that I left you is the actual book, Strengthening Stark, that goes into a lot of detail. So if you have a few minutes, you may want to look at that. Some of the key ones uh, is Stark County's population in 2000 was 378,000. By 2040, it's expected to decline another 6%. Over the next decade, the only age group in Stark County uh, that will grow or, uh, as compared to national averages is for those that are 65 plus. And the percentage of Stark County residents living in poverty rose from 9% to 15% since, since 2000. So as a community, we're getting older and we're getting smaller and we're getting poorer. So if that was your customer base and you sort of looked at that trend, you'd get a little bit alarmed. So we started to look at, at ways that we can do things a little bit different. There are 23 economic developers operating in, in Stark County. Uh, throughout our county, people through chambers, uh, places like the Stark Economic Development Board, Maslin Development Foundation, Alliance Development Foundation, and cities uh, have economic developers. So we started uh, getting, there were 23, and we got them started a little over a year ago, and we've been meeting every other month, trying to look how we can work and collaborate more together. There are gonna be times and I haven't seen many yet where we may compete for business, but as a whole, the whole county and what we're seeing with some trending, we have to work together a little bit better if we want to turn these trends. And then we, uh, through the Stark Port Authority, able to get a grant to do an economic development plan for the community, which uh, our partners, and including those here in North Canton, Mark Serretta, Doug Lane, attend, have helped us through that. And the goal is by the end of June to have some strategic things put in place on how we operate. And I'll share some of those. This number is a little outdated. We've talked to over 150 community members. How do those members in those conversations, we've started different subgroups like the uh, minority business leaders. We've also uh, got the five college presidents together. We're working closely with 
uh, the, Joe Chaddock and the Stark County School Superintendents. So it takes a lot of folks working in different directions. And I'll show you some of the things that uh, we're focused on. Our big Achilles heel in the county right now is our workforce. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that and how to connect that going forward. Try to retain and grow existing businesses. There's a lot of discussion on how to track businesses, and that's very important. However, our greatest opportunity, in my opinion, for growth is with our current businesses. Stark Economic Development Board is uh, with in the 18 county Team Neo area. There's grant money available through the state of Ohio, and our goal is to try to get our unfair share of that money. Uh, a year ago, we had grants of 135,000. This year, and largely in part to a $1.6 million grant with Union Metal to get that reopened through the state, we're closer to $2 million this year. So that happens when we're going out talking to our businesses uh, as a community and finding out ways that we can help them grow. We're looking at growing targeted industries. We'll talk a little bit about how we're doing that. Entrepreneurship, how, trying to help with, with startups and Walsh College, The Garage, and Ron Mance help us with that. And infrastructure uh, is sort of a longer term issue that we have to deal with. We don't have a lot of shovel ready sites in the county. And it's a very competitive when we're trying to attract businesses or keep businesses that you have uh, sites that are available. We have a lot of brownfields that we have to deal with. So we don't have the funding as a, a county right now to address those, but that's something that we have to address if we want to change these trends. And the biggest thing we're trying to do is get everybody to collaborate and figure out ways that we can work together. I base how well we're collaborating by the attendance at uh, our meetings with our economic development partners. We had one uh, last week, and our attendance is running right about 98%, which means people are engaged, and our goal is to keep as many of them as possible uh, engaged in this process. I mentioned job creation, job preparation, and job access. We've never had uh, a real deep dive into this. We know it's a problem. If I walk in, uh, last year I walked into over 100 businesses, and the biggest issue is they can't fill the jobs that they currently uh, have available. So what we did, if you look at this number, anybody know what that is? That's the number of jobs, maybe a little high, available in Stark County today. And that's from Ohio Means Jobs, and it might be high, but if you say it's 5,000, imagine what it does to a tax base in a county if you can fill the jobs that you already have. So we've never really, as a county, looked at as the open jobs. So if you look at the next one, we're looking at this like you would a business, the supply chain and the demand side of the business. So of those 7,000 on the demand side, this pie is what qualifications that that person would need to have that job. And if you hit the next slide, you can see associate's level degree, bachelor's, uh, GED or high school diploma. There's some doctorate and master's, about 170 of those. So I look at this as an opportunity if this is your supply side. Imagine if you had 170 master's and doctorate jobs that you could fill in the community. What kind of impact would that have on your tax base? And currently, in Stark County, 40% of our residents travel outside the county to work. That's about 15,000 people. About 7,000 come in to Stark County to work. So it's a net loss of about 8,000, which is higher than the average. So our goal is to try to figure out how to fill these jobs. And if you look at the open positions, uh, Altman Hospital has more openings right now than they've had, uh, according to their folks, in their history. And so we can see a portfolio of different jobs, and our, our goal is to try to connect these folks closer to the, the supply side of what we're produ producing as a county. Next slide. Hard to read this. These are 13 bars. Uh, the one on the right is about 4,600. The one on the, my far left is 3,800. Does anybody have any idea what this is? Is that salary? No. That, that uh, far right is the number of Stark County students that are going to be graduating here in the next two to three weeks. Wow. The one so on the that, far... Is that, I'm sorry, is that like over the past how many years? No, this is actually far right, my far right is the seniors. 
Very far left is our kindergartners. Uh, so it's a present population. Present population. So it goes from around 4,800 to about 3,800. So you can see the trend in the school districts and how, if we don't change this trending, how it will affect our schools. Uh, there's only one school district in Stark County that's growing in enrollment. Anybody know what that is? Everybody says Jackson, it's Canton City. If you look at the third grade in Canton City, it, you'll see a big bar. And we've talked to the Canton City and said, why is that? You have to pass in third grade a proficiency test to move to the fourth grade. So a lot of the charter schools are filtering into that Canton City School District, and that's why you see that population uh, growing. All of those, everything we uncover, and that's why I love data, it gives you sort of an, a look at what's going on as you would do if in a business to see how can you go after and, and change some of the trending that you see. Why is it important? The next number. That's how much we spend in Stark County to get a, a child from kindergarten to graduation. So what we have to do is try to connect the dots. I describe this as a, right now as a dating service that isn't working. I have people on this side that I walk into business and say we need people, and we look at our supply side with our colleges and our high schools, and we need to try to connect them and connect them a little bit earlier. There's an article in the repository a week and a half ago, the first step, and thankfully we have Joe Chaddock as a great superintendent for the Stark County Schools. We started uh, by doing six locations, all senior students and tech students were able to go to sectors, healthcare, uh, trades, uh, IT, and visit, come with a resume and talk to businesses. And, and if you read that article, uh, it, the first couple of sentences says it best. A young lady from Maslin, graduating senior, wanted to be a counselor, had an STNA certificate, and was going to go to Kent State main campus to go to school. She ran into the Altman folks and didn't realize that she could use that certificate and do what she wanted to do by going to Altman School of Nursing. If we can make that happen and keep her in Stark County, it's a better chance that we may be able to continue to keep her mm -hmm. here in Star County. So those connections where they used to be made at seniors in high school, we're trying to get that pushed back so we can start to, to teach those kids at the eighth, ninth grade level what opportunities are out there. And uh, Joe's hope uh, is that the freshman class now has some type of mentorship or connection with a business uh, by the time they graduate. If you're in business, our, our message to the business is if you think you're having problems right now trying to get people in the workforce, the trending shows that you have to sort of go an Urban Meyer approach. Urban Meyer doesn't roll the football out in August and hope that guys show up to play football. He starts in eighth or ninth grade to recruit them. So we have to get with the parents and those kids to let them know what kind of opportunities are available in Stark County. Junior Achievement gave us some data. Eighth graders, the second least interested thing they were in, interested in as a career was manufacturing. 17% of our workforce is in manufacturing. So that's the kind of thing that we're trying to work for, work with on the workforce issue. So key is data, increase the accuracy and awareness of, of what we have available, align the supply and demand through middle school career education, parental engagement, uh, promote career pathways so those students know how they can get uh, where they want to go and what wages they could make. Uh, go after at-risk employee support, and we're working uh, with many great agencies. Uh, there are so many assets that we have, and when it comes to workforce, we're trying to organize them. So if a, a business calls and they need a certain kind of uh, employee they want to tap into, we have a, a way that we can get to them. So I've sort of given you a bunch of doom and gloom. Let me give you some good stuff. Cleveland State did a study, more than 100 and perhaps as many as 600 companies, depending on the metrics you use, experience, are experiencing rapid growth in Stark County. This is in Jackson Township. That's Patriot Software. So what we've done is all of those partners all make business, what we call business retention and expansion calls. We go out and talk to businesses. And, but we didn't do them collaboratively. 
So we've divided a, and put together a database. We now have a database of every business in Stark County. And if you look, it's hard to read this, but we, there's 50 million and above, sort of our large businesses, mid-sized organizations, seven to 50. If you put those two together, it's about 587 businesses that fall in that category. So within the next two years, we're trying to visit all of those, including those that are here in, in North Canton. The smaller one, under seven million, which is not small, you have to target them also. There's about 15,000 of those in Stark County. Some of those are doctor's offices, sole proprietorships. So what we're doing is launching a, a portal called Business 911. So if you're in business and you have any issue, if you have a workforce, finance, if you're looking to expand, you can go to Business 911 and then we'll tie you into our network. We in Star County, when it comes to attracting business, sort of work like a mash unit. We get a lead and then we all scurry around. And, and uh, we're trying to do a little more collaboration on how we market the community outside, but you can't do a shotgun approach. Very difficult, and very competitive. So we've looked at what we're good at and we're honing in on really four categories that we think that we can go after. Uh, petrochemicals and plastics, there's a new cracker plant going in on the Ohio River. It's a $1.6 billion cracker plant. Uh, they're uh, talking about putting two more. Uh, cracker plants uh, make the feedstock for plastics. We're within five hours of 70% of the plastics consumption in the U.S. Within the last five months, I've had two calls from plastics companies looking to locate here. We think that's an opportunity to tie into what's going on uh, because of our rail. Uh, you can get plastic feedstock into Stark County. So that's one of the areas. The other is food processing. If you look at our area, we have Freshmark. Uh, Shears is located here. Superior Dairy, Beery Cheese, Brewster Cheese, another targeted area. Obviously, manufacturing and, and tourism. Our tourism's grown uh, by 20% over the last 10 years. Doesn't mean we don't go after all of them, but a focus start in this area uh, is what we're looking at. And I mentioned improved in infrastructure and looking at existing job hubs. We have a thing called the Stark Entrepreneurship Alliance to help people with ideas, put it together a business plan, and that, of all the things that we do, is probably the, the farthest down the road. The key, I think, is measuring. You probably figured that out, like you do in a business. This is what Jumpstart, who's doing this for Stark County. Jumpstart's a nonprofit out of Cleveland that uh, we've worked with. They did this in Richland County. If you go on richlandvitalsigns.com, th this is how they're measuring as a community. It goes under three categories, economic development, workforce, and entrepreneurship. And if you hit economic development as an example, this is what you'll measure. When I took this job, everybody asked, well, how many jobs did you create? How many jobs are we going to create? And if our goal for, from the state of Ohio was 450 jobs. So at the end of the year, on paper, we did that. But Alliance Castings went out of business. That was 325 jobs. So we really didn't create 450 jobs. And if you do that since the 1970s, you wake up one day and go, oh, Whoops, we got a problem. So I think some of the things we're looking at measuring is something we can look at as a community and figure out are we winning or losing. So you do look at employment. Dominic would appreciate this, median sale price of a house. That should be a pretty good indi indication. Percent of people in poverty. So if you're really moving the needle, you're going to be able to tell by those kinds of measurements. There's five in each category that we're shooting to out publicly so we as a community can measure. So finally, what to expect next? Our plan should be finalized this summer. We'll wish you SEDB. Uh, this is not our plan. This is the community's plan. Uh, we'll issue regular updates and there'll be an online dashboard available so you can track how we're doing. 
So we have two roles now. We, our historic role is what I told you in the beginning, and now our sort of new role is leading the strengthening start for the community. We do that currently with a staff of four, uh, and we're looking for uh, funding from some foundations and some regional uh, players that may be interested in helping us move this down the road. I think Henry Ford sums it up for Stark County. Coming together is the beginning, staying together is progress, but really, where we're really gonna change these trends if we start working a little better together. So I'll take any questions. You have everything in the packet I left you, including uh, the Strengthening Stark Report. And I appreciate your support and, and uh, the time you gave me here tonight. Thank you, Ray. Any questions? Ray, I would just say <clears throat> um, the trends I see is uh, millennials, trying to keep the millennials here, because uh, they're, you know, they're, uh, geared to go off to the school and they want to leave this little town because right. uh, they don't see the opportunity. They, they don't understand. And I think <clears throat> the trades, you know, we need more people thinking about that. And I think you do catch them in middle school. I think even when I was in middle school, we used to do those little what segments. They called it SRA and it was some kind of a, you know, I want to be a, a heavy equipment operator or whatever yep. the case may be. Uh, there's huge opportunities for entrepreneurs and I'd like to see, that's what I'm excited about North Canton is you know safe uh, communities with parks and amenities and neat little shops and yes. cafes. Uh, that's a draw plus the school system. So uh, I'm pretty excited. I have a lot of great ideas myself, and you know, we're talking to everybody here. I think uh, we're real excited and we're happy that you're involved because I know you're a uh, maker and a shaker. Well, thank you. And I and I think one of the assets I didn't mention is you're absolutely right, and you have a great asset in Walsh. There's 21,000 college students to spend four years here. And if we can connect them with the businesses and keep them here, um, I, I think that's key. I, I love something Alliance is doing, and then I'll let you go, uh, to keep their students. If you graduate <coughs> in the top 15 at Alliance High School, you get a full ride scholarship, room and board to Mount Union. And then you have to interact to, uh, to keep that with the business community. So a lot of those brightest and best are, are staying here. So we have to do that as a community. And uh, because we do, it's a great, great place to live. All right. No. No. Thanks for coming up. Uh, I hope, uh, first of all, is you're here to ask for money, correct? Yes, we, uh, okay, we, so we, are should be, we should be clear about that, that right. you're seeking a contribution spread out over 36 three years. Months. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> I think if you look at some of the stats, uh, the case you make is pretty compelling. Uh, I think we, as, it, as I mentioned prior to the meeting, I looked at two sets of numbers. Um, I looked at the Jobs Ohio monthly metrics for not only Stark County but Summit County over the last seven months, and they're appalling. Yep. There's simply no excuse for uh, that performance, and I don't lay that at your feet. No. And I guess that's the point I'm, I'm going to come to. Um, we did exactly one project that they report in seven months. Mm -hmm. Poor Summit County only got two. Uh, there were 112 projects statewide, so we hardly got anything. Um, I took a look at the job creation tax credits over the last 10 years, of which Stark, there were 18. 2016, there was one, and in 2017, there were none. Right. Uh, I think we do need to get our act together. Uh, but as you're here to ask for public money from the city of North Canton, I would like to emphasize, and I, I don't purport to speak for anyone else, our number one economic development priority is across the street. Yep. Uh, I was disappointed in this document, no reference to it. We've got members of the school board here tonight because they are in a, I don't want to use the word financial crisis, but we need capital investment in this school district. And somehow I'm not sure that that message resonates in Cleveland with Team Neo or in Columbus with Jobs Ohio. Right. I will tell you, that I have found in my experience that their programming is not efficient, 
doesn't work at the speed of business, it's not imaginative, and at the end of the day, doesn't do much here to help us. Now, I understand that they're, they've, they've provided some funds for Union Metal, hooray, but we need more of that support here. Those organizations were liberated from state law so they could be nimble mm -hmm. and quick. And I think you and I have actually sat around the table and talked about innovative workforce ideas that frankly they just couldn't deliver on because it didn't fit in their, in, in their scheme of things. You know, so I guess as, as if we're going to be a player here in the Stark Economic Development Board scheme, number one is, I want to make sure that we've got somebody on that board mm -hmm. that speaks for, for this community. That's A. I mean, swear them in, let them vote, mm -hmm. let them know what's going on. Somebody's got to be there. Number two is, and I guess this is my ask, we need, we're going to, we're now going into a gubernatorial year. There's going to be a review of Jobs Ohio and TMEO's performance. We need to make sure that it understands that there is more to the state of Ohio than Cleveland, Columbus, and Cincinnati that a $5 million project that doesn't cause anybody to bat an eye in Columbus is a big bloody deal across the street. That's $116,000 of ta property tax revenue, the bulk of which is gonna go to our school system. We need that. And I'll be honest with you, Ray, I don't know how we engage Team Neo and get it to be more aggressive than it is today. Well, let, let me address a little bit of that. I agree with some of the things you say, disagree and with you others. you can take exception yep. with others. Uh, on this nimbleness, the, uh, I work with a gentleman named Walt Good from Team Mail. Walt. Yep. We turned, uh, most projects we can turn in five weeks and get a grant. The problem and why we're focusing on the BR&E calling, you do not get the funding after a project has started. You have to go to the state. Understood. So by going out in front of our businesses, we just talked to a business last Friday that uh, potentially is looking at a $60 million expansion. They had no idea that there was any state, potential state grant funding. So I agree with some of the things you say, but it, why we're making these BR&E calls is because we're trying to rustle up and get what I mentioned before, our unfair share of the money. So some falls on, what you're saying, but some falls on well, us as a community. You know, you know Rolf, it, one of the things that's happened over the last eight years with the establishment of this new architecture is that there was a, a fairly robust uh, BR, BR and E yes. network that functioned not only here, but elsewhere. Elsewhere, yep. And it all kind of got washed away because it was going to be taken over by Team Neo, didn't happen, and now we're back kind of rebuilding this, having, yes. you know, having to start from scratch. Again, my point is this, is that I think we've got a huge, huge challenge in front of us. Uh, it's gonna take everybody pulling for I agree. it. I support it, but I've also gotta ask that this community, this community, get on somebody's radar other than the group around the table. Right. We've gotta have capital investment. Uh, yep. uh, let me pose a, just a couple of things, because you make some good points, but um, first of all, Ray, thank you for coming. Yes. Ray's been involved in more things than any other person that's done with our community the last year, okay? First of all, the children's thing probably wouldn't have happened unless he came in here. Secondly, he has probably spoken to that pe people across the street and other people more than anybody's had except for our own economic development. And I want to thank you for that. And we, yep. we hope that continues to go on. And then third, he, uh, they are going to put someone on our board. So if you, you yes. can go ahead and explain that, if you could go ahead and do that. And I think that was... One of Daryl's also. Yep. Yep. Yeah. My, my, my point is this, is that what, he, what Ray's doing is the standard. We expect him to do that, mm -hmm. to help with that on shoulders. I expect that to happen on that position. Yep. That's his mission. That is his charter. What I really want to say is our site selectors that Walt Goods bringing in to look at the properties across right. the street, new capital investment. Frankly, we're going to have it's an 80-20 split, as you know. Right. Most of your growth is going to occur with your existing companies. That's what the R&E calls take care of. Yep. But what we also need is to figure out a better way to capture some of these newer opportunities, like what Ball down on, is it, is it Ball down on 
Yeah, Paul. Yeah, yes. Which came in 15. Right. We need more of those. And one of the ways, and I didn't touch on this, but when we're making our BR and E calls, especially in food, like we talked to the food processors, it's easier if you have business in the community that's available for them to try to attract them. So like the food processors, we said, tell us what in your supply chain you're missing. So we can try to go after and fill that. And if I can go to a business and say, listen, I have four customers for you in the community that would be interested in having you there, that's, I think, how we have to be a little more aggressive. But I agree, we, ha we, we have not had a lot of attraction, and, and that's something that really has to, has to change. And I, I, you know, I think you know, part, of, part, of the, part of the challenge we have, to be honest with you, is, is it's a wage issue. Yes. You know, we've got a, a lot of employers that aren't paying a wage that would induce someone to leave the living room and go to work. And, the, and, and that's a challenge. That is a challenge. I think we're at a good time. To, to educate people because it's affecting their bottom line when they can't fill the workforce. Somebody was telling me at the food processors that a Canal Fulton McDonald's paying sixteen fifty an hour. So, you know, it's to try to attract. A lot, a lot of that too is drug testing. Yeah. I know yeah, a lot of manufacturers that should yeah, not get huge. good people because they can't pass the drug test. Right. I mean, there's a shortage of truck drivers too. They'll pay bonuses and everything to get you on board, but but you can't pass the. I guess the point test. we make to come back to it. So necessarily directed to start development. Right. Mine is this other architecture out here that most folks aren't familiar with and they don't realize the gravitational pull it exerts on economic development in Northeastern Ohio. And my contention is and the numbers suggested yes. it hasn't served us very well. And if us being engaged will get us better service, I'm all for that. Okay. okay, that's fair. So you come back and ask for the next tranche, let me know how you're doing. Report to the community on whether our money's been well spent. How's that sound? Sounds like a deal. All right. But we did get representation on, on their board, so right. I think uh, that's a good deal if you want to explain anything more. Yeah, what that. we do is uh, the business community serves on the board, then we have uh, uh, governmental representatives. I quite honestly don't know why North Canton wasn't on there. I was actually surprised. Oh, well, you, you now have a seat yeah, along. Yeah, always agreed to pay them, and they've never given us their vote. Right. Huh. So, well, that's why we're glad you're here, right? Yeah. And so... And your arms are still attached. What's that? <laughs> and your arms are still yeah, attached. That's right. So, yes, I, we, we need a representative from North Canton, so that'll start in, in our June meeting. Yeah, and, and, Thank you. And, 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 you're welcome. And to, to Mark, my last point, Mark's been, or to Mark's point, Ray's been See, it, so that's what I have to do before next year, right? Yes. <laughs> we'll do it, Ray. We'll All right. Uh, Anything else? Yes. Uh, just, just a few comments. First off, Ray, thanks for coming. Yes. Every time I call you, you're always responsive, and you take care of us, which we appreciate. And the Start Development Board, when you look at the Start Development Board, you know, they facilitated our greatest success here. And this was back after we lost the Hoover Company. And we had the $5 million Job Ready Sites Grant. Yes. And that was actually right at the, uh, when Governor Strickland first became governor. And uh, we helped coordinate that. And, and without, that, without that grant, I'm not sure where the city would have been. So we greatly appreciate that. But you know, there's a huge gap that I see regularly, and I've seen this develop. And there's a, there's a, uh, a significant communication gap between the high schools and the college students, and the manufacturers, yep. and the businesses. Now it's a it's it's a shocking communication gap. 
I've had in the past two months two CEOs, well, one was a general manager for a local manufacturer here uh, for precision manufacturing that needs more talent. The, the drug testing is one issue, but the other is that he would like to go and start getting the students in ninth, 10th, 11th, 12th grade so that he has something to, to work with. They have a foundation for his business. The next had another company, C, uh, IT CEO, uh, out of California that had come here to uh, North Canyon. These two individuals never met. Both said the same thing. They want to get the kids started in high school. Yes. Then just last week, because oftentimes you'll get um, uh, kids that graduate from college that, uh, you know, they need a reference. They will call for a job re reference, which is, it's nice that I'm able to provide that to them. Or they're looking for a job. And what's amazing is that you have kids coming out of college and they're not sure what to do. They're, they're not sure what's available. And so when I saw the one slide, where you had uh, two hires that we'd like to have as talent recruiters? Yes. That's fantastic. Well, and, and if you could share the CEOs that want to mentor, because we're trying to hook them up. But the other thing is, is trying to get folks heading in the right direction. 54% of, sorry to keep throwing these data points at you, 54% of our Stark County kids who go to college don't graduate with a degree. So they graduate maybe with debt, without yes. a degree, so introducing them earlier to maybe what's available. Mm -hmm. If uh, And I'm not just picking on the trades, but we have welders in Stark County making six figures now. Absolutely. So, And, and a lot of the students. We need more so, trades. More trades. Yes. Yeah. A lot of the young people, they're, they're just not aware of what the opportunities are. And, and, you, and you would say, oh, no, come on. They, they, but, but they don't. Yeah. They, they don't know. So there's a really... Uh, significant communication gap and that's where you folks have bridged the gap because even with um, I've noticed also with the schools and this is just in general this is not specific to any any high school but it's getting the the schools connected with the employers and and you're fortunate North Canton schools Jeff uh, is participating in one of our workforce great great individual and we're trying to uh, he's very uh, on the forefront of that so yeah, really North, North Canton has done a really good job of that. It yeah. makes a big, it makes a big difference. And your business entrepreneurial group, I visited them. Those fantastic uh, students. So just got to keep them here. Yeah. That's the just key. put an exclamation point in, in race. We won't disclose the company, but we had an opportunity for a co local company that's growing significantly to hire individuals without college degrees. Mm -hmm. These jobs paid to start thirty-five thousand dollars out of high school. Our good friends, and you can take the fifth on this, at Team Neal and Jobs Ohio wouldn't provide training, short-term training for those those individuals because they weren't in the sector that they prioritized, which is absolute nonsense. Here was a way to keep people in this community earning a living wage with great benefits, including educational reimbursement from day one mm -hmm. for their college degree, and we couldn't get a take on it. It's a bureaucracy, it sounds like. Yes. Well, it's, 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 it's a focus and a philosophy that doesn't work in small communities. It may work fine in Columbus, where you've got or Cincinnati or Cleveland, but in communities like ours that are struggling to hang on to their, yes. their, their, their students, their kids, what criteria defines the sector? They have chosen the sector, have they not? Yeah, the only, the, I don't know, the one you're talking about, I think, is a, our friends in North Canton. Yes. Yes. They, Say no more. yeah, there was a reason they held off on that, which I can't get into now, because uh, we, there might be a bigger expansion opportunity, so the company held off. However, for Akron Children's, they don't, they'll do, um, they don't address anything that's what they consider community serving. So like Services. hospitals, uh, they focus more on manufacturing, yes. uh, IT, uh, those kinds of sectors. That's how the state looks at it. But the point is, is that not everybody, all 
always has the luxury of a broad economic base. Ours here, in this particular case, with $17 an hour jobs, was concentrating in this right. sector. Right. And these were jobs where the turnover was relatively modest, I recall. Mm -hmm. And these were good jobs with a career track. Mm -hmm. And the point is, is that we need more aggressive, more creative help. Those liquor proceeds, which I'm assuming that we all support, were made private to facilitate creativity and initiative. 800 million. Reported. 800 million dollars. That's a lot more than that. Last year was 825. Yeah. Well, there you go. How much was that? 825. So. You know, Ray, that's kind of my, my take here. I've done my part. It's a public meeting. I've said yeah. my piece. Uh, kick it upstairs. Uh, but, you know, we're glad you were here. Well, thank you. Yeah. So. Make it Anything happen. else? Make it happen, big boy. All right. Okay. So before I go, here are the five keys to the Cavs Celtics game tonight. Next slide. I could just tease on that. <laughs> so I always wanted to do that. <laughs> Thanks, thank Ray. You, Ray. Thank, thank you, Ray. Thank you very much. To our agenda, first up, community economic development. Uh, Mr. Fonte is going to recuse himself. Let the record reflect. He will recuse himself from the uh, discussion. We'll come get you when you're done. Maybe. All right. Thank you, Chairwoman Diesel. new construction and repair are discouraged. Mm -hmm. So, you know, whatever that looks like, uh, that's what the, what the zone should be. I mean, it's got to be consistent with, with the law. Yeah. So, I, so if we I promoted a whole, a whole area where we knock all the homes down, would that new, be new construction? Well, yes, no. It would, we yeah. Have, yeah. yeah. We're not yeah. Homes down. yeah. No. Well, the map that I provided was asked to provide, which is the colored map. Yes. You is provided the colored one? Yes. Yes. Okay. That's from 99, correct? That, this yeah. is the old, the two old That is what was last existing. Right. Okay. Yeah. Just to make sure. there's, a, there's about a dozen maps that we could have looked at, but I thought this would be the one that you most successfully launch from if you're going to do something. That, that's Take that. Essentially, the only difference between 09 and 10 is just the way you described that there was a cost savings in publishing. The description in the newspaper, the savings was instead of doing a meets and bounds descriptions that covers page after page where the pins are, are, are placed for the parcels, it simply had the map. And so it was a couple inches versus maybe a dozen pages. Uh, four to five thousand dollar savings in, in publishing, but that was 0910, and I think what's important about that is from the 99 2000, what you have on the screen right now, to the 0910, there were no applications in that expanded property. So you expanded the area, but no one, I guess, was attracted to it. David? And I just, you know, one thing, too, is just like looking at the larger picture, um, one thing that we should clarify is what is it that we want to incentivize? Mm -hmm. Right, that's the second. What's our objective? Right. So we set yeah. And, and it's, it's pretty clear that when you look at, that I would recommend is clearly we want 
residential aspect, when you when you just look at it from uh, you know the revenue that we get from a job is guaranteed. The revenue that's generated from the residents is uh, I think our finance director. Negative. Yeah, it's, it's like less than forty percent or thirty six percent of the people that live in the city pay income tax, and that's due to people working outside the city but live in the city, or you know they could be retired or a number of different reasons. But the thing is, if we focus on incentivizing jobs, that's what that's what guarantees us the. I agree. That's a great objective. Does everybody agree with that? And if, if that, that would be our first objective, but I'm not against building up areas that are need. Right, right. You know, I mean, let's let's just take a look at what is. You know, what is somebody happens over here, wishbone syndrome, uh, and then these homes around here. Now should be like, we should really incentivize these people to get these things right. So what areas of need, and maybe there's a couple areas of, that are not in, in big need right now. Maybe we need to target those folks. And Doug and I were talking, how do you do that? Compared to, you know, do you look at different ages of homes? Do you look at just certain areas? I mean, how fair can, I mean, it, it's, right. a, it's a tough call. Well. I'll go back to my ward, and we all have some of the older North Canton uh, housing everywhere in the city. But, you know, I think that 2009 better reflects, you know, the four-inch corridor. Yeah. I'll call it, or listen, we just put a bunch of infrastructure down at West Park, Parkview, uh, you know, the, those immediate areas, and we want, now we want the houses to catch up to that. And, and Portage, as you know, we long-term plans or hopefully shorter term, but that gateway into the city, you have some of the worst housing when you drive through it, the rental, they need detention. Uh, I don't want to label everybody on that road that way. You got beautiful homes, you got some turnaround successes too. But I think that's where I want to see the influx of opportunity for CRAs. Um, get the families to stay there to improve their house versus moving, get the rentals, owner-occupied or at least fixed up. That's what I think I'm after. I think that's what everybody should be after here. And when I look at this map, obviously the main corridor is taken care of with, with business that here. Right? Sure. And, and, sure. and, as it should be. As it should be. Now we got to look at, is this map a better approximation of what, where we need to go? And why wasn't it successful last time? Why is it successful in most of other communities? Which maybe, you know, I've never looked at their actual output as far as CRA, you know, successes, but I thought we were talking about maybe having somebody come up and explain that to us. Didn't we, Daryl? We, we haven't been able to meet with those folks. Right. right. Uh, you know, because the infrastructure is getting older. Either you're going to tear it down, replace it, as some great ideas are. Even Woodrow's got some great older homes, and some of them look great. Some of them are just... So how do we address this to make sense? Here's how you do it.
you would mind just clarifying too, because when you look at taking a home, and let's say that it needs improvement, if you wouldn't mind explaining the CRA and how it works. So if you have a $100,000 home that needs a new roof, that needs <coughs> new siding, the driveway is shot, needs new gutters, right? Let's say that somebody puts in windows and, you know. Takes $40,000. All 40 doesn't necessarily include the value of the home. Exactly. And that, that value will be established by the auditor's team. Who does the independent value of home. Right. Yeah. So, so maybe could, they only get a appraised value of 15000 Right. And then we're working off the 15000 for the CRA. Is that what we're talking about? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so, so let's say that somebody, so the, so the question is, if you have a $100,000 home and then they put new windows and siding, driveway and they, they put significant investment in but the county auditor only raises their appraisal from a hundred thousand to let's say one ten it's ten and so it's ten thousand right yeah. now the, the CRA is they're going to experience a savings off of the increased property tax off of the ten thousand that is correct right but so it would really be like ten percent what their property tax is. So let's say their property tax bill is $1,000. Uh -huh. And now with the improvements, it's going to be 1100 No, it's the same. So, so the, the point CRA is, won't go up. the point no, is, it's a, so it's a, it's a, it's a very, it's a, so it's a, it's a good thing to have. I'm just saying that it's a very small amount right. of return. Whereas one of the members of council two weeks ago mentioned about the loan, we were talking about the loan right. program. Mm -hmm. So if somebody's having a hard time getting a loan, they need the roof replaced, they need the siding, new siding put on, and let's say that's, you know, 15, 20,000, but they don't have the ability to, they don't have the cash. So if there's some sort of loan program or loan interest, you know, that we could work through a bank, well, you do them both. Right. Well, let's but, but, but here again, I don't think the county, the county appraisal is what you're going to sell your house for someday. Right. It's just, it's just, it's, it's just that. Right? But, right. But for the interested parties tonight, the school, for example, well, I mean, really they, they really want to know what's, what's the, what's the, the tax plan. Right. And it is going to be on $110,000 in added appraised value. not going to have a $5 million building and giving up $600,000 if she goes to school. So that, that's, well, that's a separate that, issue. that was right. a separate issue, but that's what we fell into, which was yeah, I think, you know, I, think we've got, I think we've got sort of two issues here. One is we want to have something in place for these older neighborhoods. Right. And let's just call them for the older neighborhoods. See what happens. So if somebody comes in and they push the back of the out and they put in sixty or seventy thousand dollars because they like living on bonnet. That's what which I did. did. 100%. Uh, then okay, they're in the they're in the zone. That's a that's a good that's a good objective. Right. And the neighbor right. might do the same thing right. and, and not do the CRA. CRA. And the next neighbor might do the thing that's and right. not do the CRA. Right. So the, in general, it helps the whole. Right. So the right. Other, the other thing that we've talked about that we would like to explore further, which is written into the, the language, is that what if we get into a situation where we've got a developer that buys an entire block and he raises it? That's something that gives us, instead of a $100,000 house, there's a $300,000 home, which Dominic sells to his millennium. I think we want to encourage that, explore that. And that's going to take some work through zoning and some other things. And then the other Marsh's point is we want to have a CRA for those commercial and industrial opportunities. And my sense is, and if you look at the chart that I passed out last week, is that frankly we ought to probably save those, see the CRA for the, for the big, big projects, of which I think there are only going to be a half a dozen potentially, and 
use other incentives like an occupancy grant, which are less controversial. They don't, right. they don't stress the schools. Right. And we can do some other things like Pat and I were talking about using a demo grant. If somebody wants to knock a building down, okay, well, I'm going to pay for that in lieu of taxes. And if you wouldn't mind just, just clarifying so everybody's clear on it, like when you look at a commercial building, and let's say it's of five million dollars. So the property tax would be like it is on your sheet in front of you. Between ten and one. So you can take take one of those. Take the million dollar property because it's right there. Okay, so a million dollars. Yeah. Okay, I, I, I have extra this. Okay. I'm gonna save this. This is good. Oh, so do you, you mind explaining it? So so the um Daryl, do you mind explaining it? So yeah. if you take you know a five million dollar property, or let's say one million dollar property, and it doubles in value right. because that's where the significant amount is. And then what role does the city play, and what role does the school play? Okay. If so that people are real. If clear. you have a, and, and again, this is this these calculations were based on on information provided by Laura prior to May eighth when the school levy passed. So these aren't truly really fresh, but close. If you exempted the real estate tax on a million dollars, the all-in exemption would be $23,000 per year. That's what it is. The city would forego 2,300 of that amount, and the school would forego 167. And that, and that's because of the percentage breakdown is roughly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a it's a ratio. And then what I did was I calculated what the what the value over ten years would be on that twenty three thousand. It'd be two hundred thirty thousand dollars. And uh, what I call the what I call the project discount uh, would be twenty three percent if you gave them a full one hundred percent abatement. And I calculated fifty percent in there uh, just for for purposes. So that million dollars again. Let's assume it's fifty. It's eleven five. Okay, you get a fifty percent total abatement. 50% abated for the year. So my contention is rather than do that, look at an occupancy grant, and I just provided some random numbers down there for 10 jobs, what it might be worth. And we're close, depending on where those jobs are paid. So, but, the, but Dave, my point is that for, for an Omni, Think about this a second. If Omni had been able to come in, we could have safely, using a CRA, discounted their project by nearly 12%. Mm -hmm. Over 10 years. 12% discount. Mm -hmm. And that's not even bringing in any kind of occupancy grant. So really, and I think an important point that you bring up, just so that everybody's clear, is that when you look at Percentage goes to the schools. Uh, I can tell you. I think four, about seventy. I would have said seventy. So, what percentage goes to the city? Uh, it's about three. About ten. About ten percent. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's about, 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 about ten percent. But here's the question: What authority does the city have of that hundred thousand dollars in increase in property tax? So. If you have a building that's, let's say, worth a uh, million dollars and they're paying, let's say, $100,000 in property tax, or the $5 million, and then, it's, and then it's doubles in size. So then their property tax increases. It doubles in size and in value. So let's say they have an increase of $100,000. The reason the schools have a strong interest in that increase is because they collect 70%, right, Laura? And the city is only collecting about 10. about 10%. So we don't get much of that. But the state law, when you're talking about granting a property tax abatement, how is that broken down? Who has, so the first, up to 50%, who has authority over the first 50%? We do. We do. City. We have the CRA. And then, right. And then who has the 
authority over the second 50%? The school. It's combined, but yeah. essentially the school right. has to be on board. So the city can grant up to, you have a $100,000 for property tax increase. It's not existing, but it's the, the future, right? The city can grant a 50% property tax abatement for that. And then the school has the authority to do the other 50%. And that's independent of each other, correct? Correct. So the city can say, yes, we're going to give 50% of the $100,000 regardless of how the school feels about it, that's just the way the law is set up, right? But of course we work with our friends in the school. And Dwight, and that's what uh, Daryl was talking about, right? Well, I, I think one of the things that Jeff would agree, would agree with you is that one of, the, one of the points that came from the superintendent's ad hoc finance committee was the challenge the school had financing and opera, its operations in a district abatements if we can, preserve the ability to have an abatement for the really big projects, and in the interim use other tools, use other tools for our incentive package. Yeah. Now, that's on the business side. I'll be honest with you, on the housing side, we're not talking about large sums of money, but historically, they just aren't there. Should be able it's a to see. process that has yeah. to come forward, and we've agreed that in the past the process never came to us. So we agree that it's going to come to us from here on out. Right. One, of, one of the things that they did is that it's not included here, but I think Tim and I kind of discussed it. And I don't know how to put it in legal language, but we could have a much more detailed commercial and industrial application that really lays out the scope of the project. You know, it's a seven pager, it's got it's got payrolls, it's got job growth, it's got capital investment, it's got everything you need to make an informed decision. So we could have a really tight operation, a tight application upon which we make a decision. Right. Right. And be sure it's not an economic development plan. That is correct. Right. 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 And we need that because when these people, I said this before, when they sit down and decide where they're going to go, they say, City One has this, yep. City Two has this, this, City Three has this. So if they don't have no idea what we have, City A and B look pretty good to them. Yeah. On the other side of it, that idea of you know the commercial before you get all involved in the occupancy grants, and I've said this before, we really need to look at the impact of what happens around it, and, that, and that's the ability that if they come to us before they build, we can make that decision. So they come to us before we say here's a here's a big deal that's going to impact everything around there. Right. Well, that's a little bit different than than just you know okay it's just a typical thing we'll do an occupancy grant. So that's, a, that's what we have to look at every time. Well, to Mark's point, if you have a, if you have a detailed application, it's coming to us prior to construction, there's nothing to say that we can't insist upon a higher caliber building materials. To your point, do you really want to drive a tone in a certain area, set a standard, say, OK, you want the abatement, I'll give you 25% for what you've got, but if you're going to do X, Y, and Z, I'll give you 50 that you can, you can work into the deal if you wish. We also don't want to make it too complicated that people aren't going to want to come. Right, that's to right. Got to get it simple on there. What we are, how competitive we are. And how, how is this process going to work? Because if it's coming to us, which is very slow, is it going to require three readings? Or can it be just a resolution accepting the CRA proposal that we've negotiated with the school? I mean, it's right. So this is an easy
and we're going to really see. I think the really big about projects, about commercial, they will be. They will be. Because we'll be looking at a lot further. <laughs> when you look at the rundown on, on Ashton Shoulders, right? Yeah, they're probably going to be right. Here's what here's what we know from recent experience. Without a CRA, without a CRA, we've had the dentist on South Main. We've had Starbucks. We've had Goodwill, and we've had Walmart all come in, make substantial. I say this now as only one of two ward council that I'm here right now. Doug, you can agree with me on this one. I'm looking at the areas in my ward that are included. They're in great need. They're also in the area of the high school, mm -hmm. the newly renovated Dogwood Pool, soon to be newly renovated Dogwood Park. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to say 98% of these homes in this area do not have basements. I've been in these homes. These are prime. For what was that? To, to, knock to, down. to knock down the prospects of that. Yeah. Well, let's come, let's come back to, 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 to mm -hmm. answer Marsha's question. I think we all agree that Main Street, that quarter, we want to clean the ground. The other thing we want to do is what neighborhoods do we want? And again, my recommendation would be to take any, any neighborhood that exists prior to 1960, any home, that's, that's how you build your map. Well, if I could just opine on that from an administrative uh, point of view, I think. Uh, 1960 is too restrictive. I mean, you have to look at in, in you have to look at who's occupying the home that's built prior to 1960, and do the, those types of homes? Um, they probably fall in one of two categories. Probably the ones down in uh, on Rose Lane that are built prior to 1960, but people of affluent means can make things happen. But in these other homes that are built in 1960, no garage, one car garage, no basement. Who's living there? And I contend that you know, most of, a, a, f a significant portion of these are rentals. Yeah, they are. And they're not people that are going to be of sufficient means to do anything. And I don't even know, reading the ordinance, whether we're limiting it to owner-occupied only. That was the question I was going to ask. Uh, but uh, assuming that it's not, uh, what incentive does a landlord have to make that capital investment because he has to be able to turn it around and get rent out of it. So I think if you limit it to housing stock that's too old, you, you narrowed the pool too much. But let's just take the home that's built in 1980. Now, to us, okay. we were in our prime. Yeah, right? I made an argument. But, in but for 1980, that, that roof on that home is 38 years old. These things need updated. To sweep in the homes that were built down where you used to live, down on, on Windy Lane, Linwood, Oak Ridge, Rose Lane, they were built in the mid-60s. Mm -hmm. You can wrap those in. To your point, it was those homes are occupied by people who would make an investment. Yeah, I guess I, the perhaps a more practical approach would be to just go out and physically do a survey of the neighborhoods for us to go out and actually look at That's what, we're supposed what, to do. Yeah, what, we're, what we're trying to get to rather than start to delineate into pre-1960, pre-1980, whatever it is, look at where the, what areas do you want to see that? Because if you drive the, the, the areas that I drive, I see a lot of uh, uh, need for improvement in homes that are built way after 1960. Not to change the point, but he made a good point there, and it was in the back of my mind here. Do we have any restrictions on, I mean, we've been up here talking a lot about not to incentivize any rental units. We've been trying to get people to kind of decrease rentals and to increase you know, owner-occupied kind of thing. Does our CRA, um, and so help me understand that a little bit, 
Uh, if I'm having a rental property, a duplex, am I able to get a CRA to, yes, yes. all right, do, well, we, do we want to let that happen? Yes, you can, yeah. I mean, do, you can, do, can we restrict that to not rental properties? Well, Would that be an idea? Do, do, do we, the question is, do we want to? Well, well, that's what I mean. We have to decide, do we restrict this to owner-occupied only, or do we let them increase their rental property? We don't want to have rental properties. Well, I mean, in general, there's a lot that do keep their rental properties nice. Just, if you want the property improved. True, but will they sell it then and get an owner-occupied who then can get a CRA and then increase that home value because as an owner-occupied and get a CRA on that? So this is just something that maybe kind of work through the system. Again, I come back to this. More than likely, the improvements that are made are going to be so modest that they will not Yeah, but the numbers are right. Well, that's where I think it's, I mean, just, just in... Just in talking to people, I think that you know clearly the gap is where people desire to make improvements to their property, but their ability to secure the funding. But then again, sort of you have to remember when the auditor speaks to us that like roofs, roofs don't count. So people right. That, that's what I'm, that's what I'm saying. And make, you know, siding probably does, and definitely driveway. Yeah, that's very funny. so that a single homeowner does not have to come before the council for that decision to be made because it's such a, a modest amount. But if you have a 50-unit apartment complex that is that qualifies as residential, then it's a different story. And that's, what, you know, of course we're not going to do that again, right? commercial property qualifies as a residential, as a residential right. and then you have one person making right. that's that's the crux of it one person making the decision well that's the reason that's i mean we should have that. that's the reason we got rid of the other one for the most part let me go back to what you said about apartments <coughs> we need people down here that's an apartment right there we need that what if we put them here we need them to 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 feed everything downtown There's a difference between having a, a, an old Hoover building that is there and a, a new vacant piece of land and a new building. Is that oh what yeah. You're well, let's say let's say someone over here. Let's say in the future that there's a, a process over here where you have all the businesses below and apartments above. Now, if 
that is, I mean, you gotta look ahead and see what do you want in your community. That's very successful mm -hmm. because those feed the businesses below. Yeah, that's that's right. an ideal situation. That's, 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 that's big Okay, we support that, but this, if that's an apartment, now how are you gonna, this you gotta be able to make this work for that. This is mixed use too, Mark. Look at this mixed use. So that will, that will work with that? But what you don't want is this open land track here between Charlotte and 40, you say someone put up a bunch of apartments and then give them 100% tax abatement. Yeah. Right. 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 That's a huge mistake. That's, that's exactly. where it hurts the school. It hurts everybody. Commercial, and that would still have to come to us anyway. Which is yes. no right. That's what you don't want to do. Right. Okay. But you could specify, you, you, you could add a sentence that apartments are not eligible. Right. So yes. apartments over in the Hoover district are not eligible. Is that what we're thinking? No, because that's no. mixed use. Zoning that's, what I was, use. that's what I was bringing up. Zoning, that's mixed use. had to step out for a minute. Did we talk about um, expansion of residential area? Pat made a comment. We were going to go out and yeah, look at Yeah, he's going to survey. How, how is that going to happen? I'm not, I mean, I don't know how. We're going to survey. Well, I think the best way would be for the administrator and the ward councilman to spend some time together going through their, their ward as a starting point and then, right then bring the at-large people in later. That's, that's great. Let's do that. That's the main priority. To come back to this whole residential issue, we, in Section 5, uh, Tim has highlighted that new commercial and industrial structure uh, must have no less than 10 new yeah, we, and additional yeah. jobs. Right. I would certainly encourage that. Well, we also talked about wanting to put a number on those, that not just the jobs, but what's the payroll? Because it could be $10, $10 an hour. Again, that could be placed where we can submit that and people know what we got. Yeah, I mean, that's right. the ideal situation. Yeah. And I, you know, looking at uh, under, under Section 6, I, I think the only other thing that I would say is we've got, we've got written in 15 years. But that's just the state I, Yeah, I pulled that down to 10. Yeah, we did. I think that's what they were. Or did we have 15 in the whole thing? I don't think we did. There were 10, 12, something yeah. like that around that. Yeah. I'd go 10. I mean, that's something else we need to do. Again, that's a, that's a Because it's in that area, because that's residential, that everyone gets the same. No Once you're residential, that's what you qualify. Yeah. That's why it goes to the housing officer. Right. Bang. I agree. Okay. All right, but if you're in section five, uh, uh, in the highlighted section, my uh, observation would be that it seems that you're structuring this so that they must um, meet a dual threshold. 10 new and additional full-time employees plus X amount of additional payroll. And it's not a, doesn't appear to be an and or. You have it as an and. Because you can have. I agree. But because if, if you have, you might have nine jobs that, that make the payroll number, but you didn't get to 10. Let's, let's come back to. Yeah, and, and you know, these, 
the other thing is too, we came up with the occupancy grant because one of the challenges that we've ran into in earlier years is when a company is projecting what their payroll will be uh, before they actually come to the city and then what the, the, the result actually is. You know, they could say that, okay, our payroll is going to be, you know, a million dollars. But then we've seen where changes have taken place and they moved to the city and their payroll wasn't a million dollars, it was $500,000. That's where the occupancy grant really worked out well because the city collected the income tax based on the number of people that, you know, that actually occupy the jobs in the city. And then the city would give that money back in the form of a grant after we already collected it. Right? Right, so if they didn't increase it and get any more. Yeah, so if they said our payroll is going to be uh, $3 million, and then it turns out that it's, you know, rather than us saying, okay, we're going to give you one and a half percent, you know, we'll give you 50% off of the income tax that you're going to collect for $3 million, well, what if, what if at the end of the year their payroll really only was $2 million? And we had already agreed to give them an amount, you know, which we don't want to do. So mm -hmm. it's based on what the city actually collects. That's why the, the, we've, we've always resorted historically to occupancy. It's really the, the number of jobs that the payroll, as you're saying, Marsha. We want payroll. We don't right, want number. Right. That's right. Let me, let me ask this question. This is merely for the application purposes okay. because in your CRA agreements you'll have terms or codicils of okay. what happens in the event that you do that and the ones that I've read, they, they give you, it, it varies, it depends on what you're trying to achieve but you can, I've seen it where you're given an extra 12 months, six months, whatever it is to remedy the situation. If you don't remedy it then the first hammer falls and then you know, you try to work them back into compliance. Yeah, I just yeah, it's, it's we exactly what down that here on the small insurance business some time ago. Yeah, yeah. we canceled right. that because they didn't meet all the, right. like, the rules. Yeah. I just, as I look at the language, and, and I will defer to Tim, but it says that the new employee shall generate at least X in annual additional payroll. And I think what we want to do is, is maybe tweak that language for application purposes, but I don't want to put us in a situation. That's why it's not written into the ordinance and it's written into the agreements. Right. So, so that you have that flex so have term has that flexibility. Yeah. So maybe we could maybe we could have maybe that's not something we want. Maybe we could in the application. We want, want some clarity there. And that could in be the a lot of that first could be the economy, sentence. a lot of things. So it's nice. Give the opportunity to waive it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Or is that more of just a threshold that you're setting? that if somebody potentially comes to the city for one of these, you're not even going to look at it unless okay. they can say can we're going to hit that threshold. Because it's always going to be an estimate because they right. have to come to you before they've done it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good yeah. point, Laura. Yeah. Okay. Put a benchmark in the, the application. All right. And you know, there's the pejorative all term, the clawback provision. Yes. Yeah. And, and the way it's written now, when we say unless waived by city council, uh, to me it seems to uh, take the authority away from the Turk. Mm -hmm. okay. The Turk stands for? Tax Incentive Review Council. So, and so every year, so everybody's clear on it, every year the, the, the Turk or the Tax Incentive Review Council meets, and what do they, so they, what do, they do? They review the terms of the agreement. They review the data compiled by the housing officer and the finance director. 
determine if they still meet eligibility uh, under the agreement. And if not, then the Turk can uh, recommend to the uh, make a recommendation to the city council that that the agreement be terminated or or amended. Or amended. Grace period. Uh, but if right. you, as as this is written now, it would seem to me that the Turk would have no authority. Right. We, the Turk needs the authority. Yeah. Just by way of note, that uh, one of the things as as we look at the administration for Laura and Ted is that when we get into a situation where on, on well, Senate they may not have performed, uh, you don't necessarily want to cancel. Turk is going to be looking at whether or not these applicants have complied with our rules. Yes. And if our rule says we're going to waive it for this period because you, there was this economic downturn or maybe it was a smaller uh, type of, uh, of office that had a few people of high income and medical condition kept them from earning and something that, that you could waive and I think they'd still be in compliance and as far as the Turk was concerned they're, they're in compliance with the, the rules and conditions that we put in our agreement. All right so the next step is Okay, next up is Street and Alley, Chairman Fonte. Okay, guys, so here's what we have. We have three pieces of legislation. Can everybody hear me good? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, so the first piece of legislation is A, um, which is basically a water fund, uh, water line replacement project, and it's um, it's going to be uh, on Eastbury Avenue, uh, Northeast Water Line Replacement Project. It's going to go from East Maple to 7th Street, and it's going to be um, no more than 700000 This will be on an emergency because we want to complete the project by October 15, 2018 this year, and the funds are coming from the water fund, of course, when it's done on Blacktown Road. The second piece of legislation on B, and by the way, I'd say we move that to agenda next week, and if... I don't say anything correct, engineer, please correct me. Week after next. Yes, yes, when it goes on, when we get the next opportunity. Dom, is these in the budget, by the way? Are these things yeah, that we're already the, These are things, go ahead, yes, Bob. Yes, Eastbury okay. absolutely was, yes. Right. We're just, and then the second piece of legislation, B, um, that's basically we're entering into a contract where Cole Avenue Southwest is. It's a sanitary replacement project, and it's gonna run, uh, the distance will be 580 feet, it'll go from Church to Harmon. And um, that's going to be $100,000, and that will be coming from the sewer fund, 100000 of it. That's an emergency, and that's going to be done by, um, you know, sometime in the summer of 2018. So, and then the road will probably get corrected as a result of that as well from Black Yeah, Tower. actually, we had coal as part of our paving program, and then double-checking that we weren't going to pave over an issue. And then dig it up. We had hoped to just line the coal sewer, but it was too far gone. It was, it was built in, last in 1940, wasn't it? I, yeah, I found some old plans from the 50s that were storm okay. and it was already on those. So, so it obviously quite old. it needs replaced. So we're going to replace it and then hopefully repave it with the paving program late in the year or like we did on Park, do it next year. Okay. 
So, so that's going to be on an emergency because we have we have to move on the time because of the weather. That'll go on the agenda as well next time around. The third piece of legislation, which is C. Uh, now, what we have here, this is something that we did in the past, and then there was a little sabbatical, and then our awesome engineer got right us back on track with ODOT. And this is something that won't cost the city any money, and it's basically uh, a bridge program where they're going to check out the uh, East Hill Bridge and over by Price Park and to make sure it meets its standard. And again, this is an ODOT thing. They're going to pay for the whole uh, the whole bit of information to check the integrity of the bridge. Yep, they'll do the annual inspection reports for the East Hill Bridge and the Glenwood Bridge. Um, they had covered us for a couple of years. We were in the program, and then for whatever reason, in October of 16, my predecessor had opted out of the program. So I'd like to get us back in with, with, with your blessing and those free bridge inspections. And free, other grants did you hear that? that are So the question I asked Rob was, is if let's say they discover uh, some integrity issues, uh, would they cover that? So what was your comment on that? It, it could, as the East Hill structure has shown us that those two structures are eligible for ODOT's entire municipal bridge program. So wouldn't that be nice? So That would be terrific. That wouldn't cost the city taxpayers a penny. Right, and that's what we're getting on East Hill, other than the guardrail we've debated, to take it to that next level. And then we've also submitted a grant application even though it's in decent shape for Glenwood. We'll and get a free bridge three or four years down the road. Right. Take it. Might as well take advantage of so, it. So and, and, and the other thing I wanted to add with this one, I didn't check the emergency. It's but not emergency. Maybe if we could look at it for maybe after the second reading, just to get it buttoned up before break. Because if it lingers, then we have break, and then you know, it passes in August, then I can't get it back to ODA for 30 more days. So look at mid You want to add emergency clause to it? You might want to do could, that. First reading, if you chose, that'd be great. Or I guess I'd ask before break if there is a second reading. Do we give it two reads? Make you may only get one by the end. Let's okay. do it. We're having a discussion now. Is anybody against that? Anybody? No. See it's not, first of all, it's not going to cost us a penny. It needs to be done. We want to have our infrastructure strong. And like I said, ODOT's all over it. Let's let them do it. Let's make motion include There's really no negative to it. Is that a motion? Yeah, I mean second. Second. Please call the roll. Mr. Wren? Yes. Cole? Yes. Yes. Keasley? Yes. Peters? Yes. Henry Bolt? Yes. Siksha to add the emergency clause to item C. Okay. You said that? All right, uh, just add it to the well, agendas, and then I think we're good for today's business. Outstanding. Thanks Thank you very much. John. Thank uh, you. May I have a motion and a second to amend the agenda and include uh, an item under Parks and Rec? Uh, it's a resolution. Um, so moved. Can we excuse myself? Uh, do you want to? You can recuse yourself. All right. That's oh, yeah. Let the record reflect. Uh, the he was doing yeah. That. yeah. yeah. Remember, Fultz is going to recuse himself from this yeah, portion of the meeting. Second. 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 Yes. Revolt. Yes. And surrender. Yes. Five yes to amend the agenda to include this. All right, thank you. This is at the request of Director DiOrio. Pat? Yes, uh, thank yes, you, Mr. President. Uh, I've asked you to uh, amend the agenda to include a, uh, uh, a resolution that we would like to get from Council uh, that would show their support for uh, the city uh, and the mayor applying for a grant uh, to the Ohio Department of Natural Resources Nature Works grant program. The deadline for the application is June the 1st. The deadline to submit the resolution supporting the application is July the 1st. So I would need council to kick this out of committee should they approve it. We'll get into discussing it in just a minute. Uh, but then when you come back for one of your June meetings, I would need you to uh, adopt the, the resolution. Uh, uh, the purpose of this is to uh, seek additional funding uh, through a different uh, pool of money with the state, specifically for uh, playground equipment that is 
uh, inclusive in origin. And I, I like to just explain a little bit about inclusivity. It's uh, one of the, the latest buzzwords in, in park talk. Uh, and it represents a real need for our community. Uh, inclusivity is playground equipment that uh, it, uh, encompasses children with disabilities. And oftentimes we think of just physical disabilities, that they're unable to walk, maybe they're in a, confined to a wheelchair, that kind of thing. But it, it's more than that. It can be it, you know, children that are blind, children that can't hear, all different types of disabilities. And there is all different type of playground that is inclusive, that, is, that caters to that need. And uh, we don't believe that there's any place uh, in the county that has this. There are some places up in Summit County that have this type of equipment. Uh, talking to some of our park goers uh, that frequent those facilities, uh, it, it's a, a tremendous opportunity for us. I think it's something that they, the state would be interested in uh, breaking new ground with on uh, that. So th that is the, uh, the pitch that we're making. We've nearly completed the application. We just need this, this piece to the puzzle to go in. So we've been playing it kind of late to the deadline as typical with competition, everybody competing for this type of thing. We wanna, didn't want to advertise it too early. But, so the deadline's just in a few days. That's a great idea to include this in addition to what we have and to make it even better. So I don't see any downside to any of this, really. Nope. 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 Not at all. Let's do it. Let's get it as fast as we can. It uh, meets a deadline. So you need this resolution. You don't need the resolution until July. No, I would like, when you, when you come back either on June the 4th uh, which is a committee of the whole, you could schedule a special session of council to handle this and anything else that there might be, or you could do it on June the 11th, which is a regular order night that you could do it then. Yeah. Uh, I would need it either the 4th or the 11th. Okay. I don't know if the 11th is going to happen. Um, we'll do a special council meeting on the 4th. Okay. Thank you. No, this is for Dogwood Park. This is the children's park that we've been talking about in our park expansion project. Um, hey, Pat. Um, Pat. Yes, sorry. Over here, brother. Hey, so uh, Whitward Park, I noticed some nice equipment going up over there, yeah. and that looks awesome, by the way. It does. So I'm excited for that. That's nice. A lot of good comments. Yeah. And, and uh, to that point with that, again, our park system is top heavy with equipment that caters to the eight to you know, 13 year old and part of the Dogwood Park program brings playground equipment for that group that are zero to you know, five or six years old that don't have huge need. Huge I have need. some of your young grandkids now. Huge okay, we need. call it millennials yeah. bringing yeah. those families. So if you watch the Main Street Exchange, the last episode of the season, I spoke about providing a park system, at least at Dogwood, that would take a child from zero to, you know, when they're tired of parks, I guess, whatever age that would be, plus the inclusivity option there. Mm -hmm. It would be, be one of a kind park. That's awesome. Thank you for your so, so zero to 13, grade. and then 13 to 18 is the smoke yeah. park. Yeah. Doug, ready to come in? Or? Yes. Yeah. Two more things. We addressed the meetings and then the letters Okay. Um, may I have a uh, motion and a second to schedule a special council meeting June 4th? Subject will be the two street and alley items and the resolution regarding the, uh, the grant request on Were there, there are three parks. items? Three, I'm sorry, and the bridge. So the three street and alley, mm -hmm. the one park and rec. Motion pursuant to the president's description of the agenda, proposed agenda. Would, would this be at 6.30 or 7? Uh, you guys have a problem with 6.30? It may not be here to work at all, so it doesn't help yet. We'll, we'll need six votes. 
for an emergency. For the street stuff, you're going to need six. Right. Okay. You could do a resolution I for the grant. Whatever, whatever the other possibility is, you just need a motion. Yeah, mine just needs a, a majority vote. You just need a majority vote. Actually, you know what? Let's do 645 because we, we only need a few minutes, right? So, yeah. yeah. Right. Do 645. Motion for discussion. Yeah. Second. Keasley? Yes. Peters? Yes. Rebould? Yes. Serretta? Yes. Holt? Yes. And Hunt? Yes. Suggest to hold a special council meeting for June 4th at 645. Yes, ma'am. All right. Thank you very much. Next up, uh, Director Diorio. Uh, thank you very much. I'd uh, like to just uh, make, uh, make council aware that, of course, this is uh, you know high grass season, high weeds, uh, and being that the spring was cold and wet, a lot of commercial mowers are behind. I think a lot of residents are behind, and I know that uh, many of you have shared some of those photos and concerns with me and we are uh, moving uh, quickly on those. Uh, we've been in contact with our uh, contractor who goes out and does it mowing these things if in the event that um, the homeowner doesn't comply. So you, you're welcome to continue to forward that to me and I will you know, move on that as quickly as, as we possibly can. Uh, you may note also, uh, those of you who have been driving around on Maple, uh, we have uh, removed the uh, overbearing cross arms uh, to the area where individuals uh, cross the street there. The, as you recall, those cross arms were you know, 25, 30 feet up in the air. I mean, other than somebody driving a tractor trailer, you know, that would be at eye level, but for everybody else, you actually got to kind of look up to get reminded of it. So they weren't, in my uh, uh, opinion, the most efficient or effective way to warn people of pedestrian crossings. You look at all the other pedestrian crossings around, there are none that are like that. So what we've done out there, or what Stark Parks has done out there on Marquardt, uh, you know, what we're doing in some other parts of town uh, is to make that much more noticeable, much more uh, eye level uh, with the lighting, uh, enable uh, people to push a button to kind of activate the lights crossing so that you, you really know whatever time of day it is that somebody could be crossing there. I think it'll be much more effective and it's taking a unified approach with what we're doing for uh, St. Paul's crossing from St. Paul's over to the Y on Main Street, uh, putting in a similar device there so that if people are walking across uh, at that time that motorists can be alerted, hey, there is somebody actually in the street that you may not otherwise see. And then also on East Maple Street by the ball fields, I think where College Street comes out. Crossing there, we are putting in the same type of crossing. They're extremely visible, highly effective, used in a lot of places throughout Ohio uh, that we kind of try to uh, emulate in some respects because they set a high standard. So we, we would like to do that. So that's just to let you know that the one that's done over here on uh, by the Hoover Company, we've taken those arms down. We have other applications we can use for them uh, in the future. There are temporary signs in place. The new ones should be installed by the end of the week. Uh, and likewise, we'll move around to these other locations. So let council know about that. 
Well, first of all, thank you for getting that done. That is something that we've all talked about, so thank you. For yeah, I mean, that was like, you have to have like triple vision to see everything you're supposed to be watching. And then with the rain at night, it was horrible. Hey, so real quick, just the you know, flashing light he's talking about, they put the new ones over at uh, Maple there where the bike, bike path is. And if you go by where it's sunny there, I mean, you, you can't miss it. It's so, it, it's so eye-catching. And it's nice because when you hit the button, it flashes for a couple minutes or whatever, and it's safe. I like it. I'm glad you did it finally. Great job, Pat. Thank you. Thank you. Um, also, uh, uh, the engineer and I have met with uh, representatives from Verizon. Uh, Verizon uh, is in town uh, and has is under the uh, strong belief that North Canton is a great community to have a lot of Verizon customers, and so they're looking to upgrade their um, uh, capabilities here to the to the 5G. Uh, as you know, House Bill 478, uh, I think that passed, uh, allowed the municipalities and the townships more input into how these mini uh, small cell technology uh, towers are deployed. Previously, under a different bill, uh, the utility companies had their way, but the legislature saw the wisdom of that. And um, in looking at some of these uh, transmitters, they would just fit, it's like a narrow wire that fits on top of an existing telephone pole or street light pole, hardly noticeable, there'd be black, they'd kind of blend in. The engineer and I are going to meet with them and talk specifically where they would need to locate about, I think it was about a half a dozen, three, three, lo three locations that they need, but it would greatly uh, impact our community and make it uh, much more adaptable to the newest technology. So I wanted to let you know that. As we narrow it down, I'll report back uh, you know, to where that might be. But so we'll be taking into account uh, aesthetics, uh, you know, interaction with uh, residents and that kind of thing. Pat, yes. so that's in lieu of them putting the sneaky towers in, right? I'm sorry, say again? Micro towers in lieu of putting the sneaky towers in, the ugly towers, correct? Yeah, this is not an ugly tower. This is a, 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 a wire that sits on top of a pole, probably like the thickness of a pretzel. Okay, fair yeah, enough. Hardly noticeable. Uh, you probably all received my condemning email regarding the Community Energy Savings Program, how all of you need to participate and do the online survey for your home so that we can earn our points uh, to get uh, uh, funding for Dogwood Park. Uh, uh, we've had an opportunity to, I think, recruit someone that could really help drive the project forward. Steve Wilder has agreed to be the chair of it. Uh, Christina Wyrick and her team over at uh, the library, the Green Committee, uh, as they're dubbed, is uh, putting this together and they have put together the plan. Uh, they've talked about it on Main Street Exchange. This is starting to roll out. Uh, we're going to go officially live on June the 1st, but we're in this start startup period here from May 14th to June 1st where everything that happens is still, we still get a credit for it. Uh, and I want to make sure that all uh, members of council uh, uh, and the administration, really all employees in the city. Uh, Pat, if you could clarify too, when we do the survey, the residents get? Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. That's a great point. Uh, the survey is free to anybody that, that would do it. And for completing it, then the uh, AEP will send you um, an energy savings kit. It has a value of about $35 uh, on it. It includes several of uh, the LED uh, light bulbs and some other things that will help you use less energy in your home. Uh, and again, the, the, the purpose of it for AEP is that the state legislature has written uh, incentive arrangements where they have to get more green and this is one of the programs that they use to make that happen so uh, that has that has begun and you'll see posters and banners and stuff that will be hung up in businesses uh, there'll be 
booths at the various city events. Uh, but from June 1st to October 1st is our timetable to hit it. And if we hit our mark, uh, the AEP will write us a check for $30,000. And that's online? That's on our website? Uh, we can, yeah, we link to we can link to our website. The chamber's got a link out there. Um, you can download the app or do it on your cell phone. Uh, it only takes maybe five ten minutes to do it. Uh, at some of the events that we'll be hosting, we will probably be walking around with uh, laptops or iPads and trying to help people that may not have that ability to do that at home to kind of help them do it. It runs from June 1st to October 1st, and this would include for businesses and uh, uh, men, uh, many of our uh, multi-tenant buildings. So Pat, the Pat. committee is reaching out and talking to all of these folks and ramping up the awareness. So here's a quick question. So we're working hard. Do we have like a little scale to say we're 5,000, 3,000, 2,500 away from our goal so we don't work hard and then miss it by like three? Is there a way to monitor our progress? Yeah, we're not going to do a uh, Don Adams, the man from Uncle. We missed it by that much. No. Uh, AP will be providing us with uh, weekly updates as to where we are on that, and then we can push that out on our social media. We've got to be winners. Uh, we should also, just from an announcement standpoint, uh, the uh, uh, Annual EMS Strong Breakfast is tomorrow morning. Uh, the mayor will be there. I encourage any of you from council to be there. Uh, this is a very big event, and all the best uh, EMS responders from around the county and their support teams and their administrators and whatnot will be there. They will be giving a little speech there, so I would ask that uh, it's at 8 o'clock at the Civic Center. It's on our turf. Gary Cohen will be at the door to take your $10, get you a nice breakfast, and get a chance to mingle with a lot of people. All right. so with that, that, that again, concludes. Pat, say that, one more time? that would be at 8 a.m. tomorrow, the EMS Strong uh, Annual Breakfast at the Civic Center. Thank you. That's pool. it. Pool. Okay. Pool's open this weekend, yeah. isn't it? Pool? Swimming pool? Well, when you say this weekend. Monday. It, yes. Monday the 28th. Yeah. That would be the day. Yes, the pool is open. Uh, we're pleased to report uh, our pool, our uh, superintendent, uh, Brian Hill, reports the 80 degree comfortable water today. Uh, so that's nice and warm uh, for what could be a cool, cool uh, May uh, opening. It's still not warm enough. <laughs> it looks great. The grass is thick. Yes. Uh, we, we did a lot of stuff over the winter for the, par or for the pool. New, we just installed new uh, trash and recycling receptacles today. Uh, we did the new benches were brought in and repainted, new feet put on so that they don't make stains on the cement. Uh, we've cleaned up the entire uh, Looks brand new. Yeah, area inside where the concessions are and the offices are and, and everything, and in addition to all the hardware that you guys authorized to put in. So we're looking at a, a, a very smooth opening. The fact that no one has even mentioned it until a week before goes to show you how smooth it's been. How about the kids' side? Did they get that updated yet? Yeah, we uh, have worked with a contractor to uh, upgrade, or I shouldn't say upgrade, I should, to repair the existing uh, features there. I uh, believe that we will be looking next year uh, as one of the capital improvement projects to kind of reinvigorate that splash pad area. Uh, Council President Peters has forwarded some information to me. We've been looking at it as well and talking with Councilman Fultz. Uh, we can reinvigorate that area. It's been, I think, Doug, since you and I were, were on council all those years ago, that, yeah. and that's been a long time, and it needs some attention. I think it was 2002, yeah. somewhere in there. He was on it, too. Oh. It, was, it was, and I think we were all three on it that time. That's from the other term, so 2007, 2008. That's about 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, by the way, you didn't mention well, I'm so glad that you brought that up. You don't want to on horn. Yeah, yeah, but you're too humble for that, but you were the, the driver on that, so that looks just yeah. terrific. I mean, I went through that whole thing, and the stuff they planted, that, that, you know, the hydrangeas, that's going to pop. It's, it's going to really pop. It is going to be awesome. Pop. And well done.
the final components start coming tomorrow. Uh, there's uh, the community clock that will be placed. There is a, uh, the guardrail and handrails will be done on Wednesday. Um, we're still in limbo yet though on the, the sign, if it'll make it by Memorial Day. Uh, the flagpole, although the foundation is laid, the pole itself is not here. It takes uh, a while to get those. <coughs> And then uh, the drinking fountain, it should be here by then. But uh, nice. those are the last couple pieces. That's it. Okay. That's good. Good job. Right. Make us okay. all look good. Thank you. Thank you. Cast by 20. Motion yeah. to adjourn. Oh, uh, by 20 already? No. Oh. That's it. I'm calling it. <laughs> Set <I wrote>. motion. <laughs> Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, opposed? We're adjourned. I went to the camp for the camp. my wife. Keep going. They need help. I know. <laughs> well, well, Ronnie, Ronnie was calling me up to say his name.